now, don't move and get re- put it in reverse. Put the car in reverse and hold it there. Hold it. Hold it. Tuesday, June 24th, 2003. Manchester, South Dakota. 23-year-old Reed Timmers tracking a supercell thunderstorm 25 miles east of Huron, South Dakota. This storm has a history of producing tornadoes, but it is cycling again north of the village of Esmond. The storm's mesocyclone begins to lower to only a couple hundred feet above the ground. As the pressure under the mesocyclone continues to drop, the air starts to condense and form the skeletal structure of what would become one of the most infamous tornadoes of the 2000s. The now wedged out tornado continues its northerly trajectory towards US Route 14, where the tiny town of Manchester stood. The once bustling railway town was now staring down the barrel of an F4 tornado. The wedge crossed US 14, wider than the town itself, wiping what was left away. Simultaneously, engineer and storm chaser Tim Samaris is getting into position to make meteorological history, trying to deploy instrumentation in the path of the tornado. He's about to unlock the secrets of what happens inside tornadoes. The 24th of June 2003 would be remembered by South Dakotans as Tornado Tuesday, with over 60 tornadoes touching down in the region. The Manchester F4 tornado would be the standout amongst all of them, however, as it wiped a town completely off of the map and simultaneously made meteorological scientific breakthroughs. Let us take a deep dive into the Manchester F4 tornado. Manchester, South Dakota was founded in 1881 upon the establishment of a post office in a growing farm village. The town grew considerably in size once a rail line was built through the town, allowing for the influx of small businesses, churches, and schools through the turn of the century. The hustle and bustle of this rail town would not last long though, as the Great Depression slowed train traffic, forcing residents to move to the larger town of Huron for more opportunity. By the 1980s, the rail line had been fully deactivated and Manchester's population continued to dwindle. The 2000 census counted the population of Manchester at 40, though most of that was decentralized from the four block center of town, which was a stark contrast to the 1,000 residents 100 years prior. The atmosphere over Manchester on the 24th of June, 2003 was ripe for tornadoes. A large trough in the jet stream was in the process of ejecting across the western half of the United States. Morning convection left outflow boundaries that reinforced a stationary front that would support the concentration of a loaded environment. Low-level warm air advection and surface heating would boast an extremely unstable environment of 4,500 joules per kilogram of mixed-layered cape. The low-level jet by late afternoon and well-timed height falls in the shortwave would support the initiation and intensification of supercell thunderstorms capable of all hazards. The very deep low-level shear was of most concern, supporting a potent tornado threat. Shortly before 6 p.m. local time, the supercell responsible for the Manchester tornado would initiate just north of the warm frontal zone, where surface winds were extremely backed. Within 30 minutes of initiation, the wound socket F3 was in progress. The photogenic tornado would roll northward at a slow pace, missing town to the west by less than a mile. A few more brief F0s would touch down in farm fields before the Manchester wedge would ultimately make its way to the ground. Upon the touchdown of the F4, the Geyer family can see the wedge from their home, which is just north of Manchester center. With a small cellar that's not large enough for the whole family, they make the risky decision to bail by vehicle and race north away from the storm. Meanwhile, Reed Timmer and company are documenting the expanding tornado from US 14. Back up! Back up! Just behind Timmer, a white Dodge caravan is blistering eastward on Highway 14. Tim Samaris, Pat Porter, and a convoying National Geographic crew and a red Ford Explorer are looking to deploy the hardened in situ tornado pressure recorders in the path of the tornado. Samaris and company have been trying for years to get a direct hit, coming very close the month prior in Stratford, Texas, and even on the Woonsocket F3 an hour earlier. 
Ahead of them was the moment they've dreamed of, a slow-moving, wide tornado to maximize their chance of getting a direct hit. They make a gutsy play, turning north on the 424th Ave, a gravel road just a half mile west of Manchester. Any miscalculation or roadblock could prove fatal. Manchester's last moments are recorded by Timmer, as a homestead in the foreground is shredded by the outer edge of the F4 tornado. The tornado is twice as wide as the small town's layout. Concurrently, Samaris is now heading east, two miles north of town for 425th Ave, where the paved north-south road option will allow for a getaway from the violent tornado. With mere seconds to spare, Samaris deploys the orange cone-shaped probe in the roadside gravel at the intersection of 406th and 425th. They hightail it north on 425th, with the vortex nipping at Nat Geo's vehicle's heels. At this point in time, the tornado is transitioning from a wedge into a tall stovepipe shape. The decaying mesocyclone has expended most of its energy, peeling back the condensation curtain to reveal a sight for the ages. The funnel would continue to elongate and wander from its original heading, curving to the northwest into the occlusion. The tornado would rope out three miles north of Manchester. The Geyers had successfully evaded the tornado via their vehicle. After the rope out, they decided to head back south towards their property in order to assess the damage. Upon arriving back at their home, they are faced with a grim reality. The home has been shredded to pieces, without a single wall still standing. Upon closer inspection, the small cellar they had contemplated riding out the storm in minutes earlier was now occupied by two 4,000-pound leaking propane tanks. Had they made the theoretical correct decision, the Geyers may not have lived to tell the tale. The rest of Manchester is a similar story, where every structure in the four-block grid had been wiped away. Samaris and crew find their probe at the intersection of 406th and 425th. The data they pulled that night reveals that there was an astonishing 100 millibar pressure drop inside the tornado over the course of only five seconds. That would be the equivalent of gaining 4,000 feet in elevation almost instantaneously, which would burst your eardrums. This scientific breakthrough shattered previous estimations of the pressure inside the vortex, back of the napkin math gave them wind speed estimates of over 200 miles per hour. Tim Samaris had just done the impossible. In the weeks after the tornado, the remaining residents had to relocate to other nearby, more established towns. It simply made no sense to rebuild a struggling town that was already on its knees. South Dakota legislature disincorporated the town of Manchester in 2004, making it officially a ghost town. Today, more than 20 years later, there are still remnants of what Manchester once was. A permanent monument was installed, recognizing some of the greater moments in the town's history, and of course, the tornado that brought the town to its end. This F4 tornado may have wiped Manchester completely off of the map, but miraculously, there were no fatalities in the event. Not only that, but the tornado provided the perfect opportunity for a trailblazing engineer and storm chaser to gather data that was once considered impossible. This data was the first step that allowed for more accurate models of vortexes in tornadoes in order to better promote safety practices in the years to come. The end of the small town of Manchester meant the beginning of a new era of tornado research for the years to come. And as always, Stay safe out there when it comes to severe weather.